Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I love speaking to students and um, presenting. And it's always so fun. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A at the end. So I hope that you can stay for that. Um, I just wanted to start out picking up a little bit where Mark um, addressed, am I uh, an artist who happens to be Mormon, or am I a Mormon artist? And people have asked me this before a couple times, and I've really thought about it. And I used to just tell people, well, it depends on where I am. If I'm in New York, I just happen to be Mormon. But if I'm here in Utah, then I'm a Mormon artist. But after having shown this here in a couple of here in Utah in a couple of places and having Mormon artists come out and friend me on Facebook or visit me in my studio or um, just contact me. I have felt that there's such a great community of LDS artists and I want to be a part of it. And so I do consider myself a Mormon artist. So let's see. I well, first, before we look at family pictures, <laughs> Um, I wanted to show you the very first movie, the very first animation that I ever made. And it's about my husband and I uh, when we were just engaged. Thank you. So little fun thing to smooth the ice. Um, so yeah, I'm from a large Mormon family, nine kids. Um, not all are born yet in this picture, but that's me on the bottom. And then above me is my twin sister, Katie, who you're going to hear a lot about. And I remember never liking those dresses. My mom made them for us, and they were very awkward and bizarre. But so was everyone in the 80s. So, um, so my very first uh, experiments in art were, was uh, something that I did with my twin, Katie. Um, we would, in sacrament meeting, we would take the programs and we would, um, Ella, oh. we would take the programs and we would draw little people in the program. And then we would press really hard around the edges to cut them out without scissors. And then we would make the people dance across our laps or fall into the pew, which was the raging river. And then we had to make new people. So. Um, Christmas time was always a time when we would uh, really un un uninterrupted exploration was what we did. And Katie and I thought that the window was like a little theater. And the shutters that would open and close were like the theater curtains. And I made a little, I just had to make an animation for you guys. So this and I remember one of the funnest things we ever did was um, we would take these tape recorders that my mom had bought. She bought a whole load of them, and she recorded children's stories on them so that she wouldn't have to come to each bedroom and read us all stories. So Katie and I took our tape recorder, and we had the story of Tom, the tale of Tom Kitten was one of the stories that she had recorded. Hereafter will be referred to as the roly-poly pudding, because that's what we called it. So we would take um, little paper cutouts that we made, of the characters, and we would put them on hangers and then move around in our playhouse window. And I remember um, this story was about two bad rats who kidnapped poor Tom Kitten. And they transported him through the walls of the house where he was lost into this little hole where they were making plans to bake him into a pudding. And the only sound that was heard was roly-poly, roly-poly, while they baked the pie. And I remember taking a handful of flour and tossing it through the playhouse window just to give it some authenticity. <laughs> so another thing my parents made for us was this dollhouse. Um, and I remember at Christmas time, again, Christmas time was always the magical time for us, we would get the dollhouse ready for Santa. And we would make little cardboard furniture. We would um, put the dollies in bed. We would put uh, lights around the uh, dollhouse. And then we would get in bed and wait. And in one case, I watched. And I saw that it was not Santa that delivered those presents for my toys. It was our nanny. So anyway, um, this next animation is inspired by getting the dollhouse ready for Christmas.
to go to a lot of different stores to find an ornament that would make that sound. And I actually didn't time it to wind back up at the end. That just kind of happened. Um, the, whole, uh, the whole thing with a lot of my animations, especially with this one and with the split house, is that I started animating without having any idea what the animation was really going to be about. I just kind of followed my stream of consciousness and I just played. And I think that play is something that all of you use to develop your artwork and to come across new ideas. My sister and her husband are both scientific researchers, and they're called basic researchers, which means that they don't necessarily have an object in mind in what they're researching. They're just actually playing around and exploring. And then other people will take what they've discovered and apply it to developing drugs or curing Alzheimer's and things like that. So anyway, this aspect of play was uh, another, another animation of mine named, called Runaway Bathtub uh, used this play, and this is my twin sister, Katie, and I. And we would imagine that the bathtub was a little boat. We would turn on the shower and fill the, fill the boat with water, and then imagine that the shower was the rain, and that it was covering the whole earth with water, and that we were carried out to sea. And you'll see the rest in just a second. This is called Runaway Bathtub. This little girl's dad was helping me write the music, and she was, I don't know, like seven, and she was running around in front of the TV as we were trying to compose, and she was singing, and we we're just like, oh, Maddie, get out of the way. And then suddenly we just looked at each other, and we knew that she was the soundtrack. So, my biggest influence in my art in these early years was my mom, Barbara. She would actually take me out of school with a note to the teacher saying that I was getting an artistic education. And she would take me into the New York City Metropolitan Museum of Art, where she would give me a nickel for every painter that I could identify. And I remember um, one, one day I earned enough nickels to buy myself a little toy in the gift shop, so I was really excited. And for some reason, OK, it was a painting that looked like this, but I couldn't find it on the Met's website. But it looked just like this with a horse rearing. And this painting stuck out to me 
over all these years. And I remember, I think I was about as high as the horse's backside. And I remember staring at it and seeing the multicolored fur that the painter had put on the horse's flanks and just thinking it was so magical you could almost see the fur blowing in the wind and I thought wouldn't that be so great if I could harness this type of magic and become an artist myself. Then also in high school I got to see the uh, Museum of Modern Art and when I went there I saw this monumental action painting by Jackson Pollock that took up it would it would take up this entire wall and seeing this painting and having this, these experiences going to these museums, I decided that New York City had to be my home someday. But there were a lot of struggles that I would have to face before getting back there. And they all pretty much started when I was 15 and I was moved from my happy home here on the east, or there on the East Coast to Dallas, Texas, where I enrolled at a very unfriendly high school and I remember the girls on the first day, I asked them if I could sit by them and they all, they got up and they turned up all the chairs and they said, these seats are all taken. So that got things off to a really bad start. Um, also, the kids that I did end up sitting with at school um, wouldn't invite me to their parties or homes because they knew that I didn't use drugs or alcohol and that's what they were all into. Um, I was always in a fight with my parents and at this time, I developed um, depression. And most mental illness strikes when you're a, either like a teenager or early adulthood. And um, so I remember by the end of my high school career, I would come home and I would get in the bathtub and I would just turn on the water and I would stay there even after the water got cold. I would just stay there until, until bedtime. And it was really traumatic. And it was so hard for me, actually, that I actually blocked out uh, those two years of the last years of high school, that there's hardly anything that I can even remember. And um, so this period of time provided most of the content for the split house. Um, here's a print that I did recently. And this is a little piece that's in the show right now. Um, called Dark Cloud. There's a song that goes with it, um, but I won't sing it at you. So I made it to New York. I enrolled at the School of Visual Arts, and I really loved it. But I was really interested in um, the work of other artists, and especially in all that was happening uh, with art history. And my paintings were really influenced by that so much that they just lacked their own life. Um, my husband had a little flare up with me because he said, I was a funny and joyful person to be around, and he didn't see any of that in my artwork and what was wrong with me. And I, I said, you know, you have me there. And he asked me a question that changed the whole course of my life. He said, is there anything that you used to do in art that would bring you joy? Why don't you think of one of those things and go back to that? And as soon as he said that, I immediately thought back to these little paper games that I used to play, and I thought about the roly-poly pudding and how much fun I had putting on that little puppet show with Katie, and I thought of all the fun that I, that I had with paper as a kid. And my art career just came to a skidding halt and it, a U-turn, and I went to my studio. I drew, this is just a sketch I did of it, but I drew a huge dollhouse on the wall, the same size as my one at home that my parents had built, and I drew little tunnels in it, and then I cut out a little paper kitten, Tom Kitten from the Roly Poly Pudding, and I just taped him up inside the dollhouse, and I said, I'm just gonna throw everything I learned about art out the window, and I'm just gonna play. But I have to get a grade, so what am I gonna do? I can't just sit here and make Tom run through the house and get a grade for that. So I went to the sculpture department, and I got a camera, and I brought it back to my studio, and I just started flipping through the different scenes of Tom and I would just kind of record him as he went through the house and doing this I actually ended up becoming a stop-motion animator and I hadn't studied animation but it was a lot of fun. So now we're gonna watch that movie The Roly-Poly Pudding. The Roly-Poly Pudding adapted from the story by Beatrix Potter. There's Tom. He's a curious cat.
And one day, he climbed up the chimney. And got lost in the walls. Do you like mice? Mm, Tom sure didn't. Did not like mice at all. His mother went searching for him. Tom could hear her footsteps, but she couldn't hear him. He tumbled into a bed of rats. They tied him up in knots. Let's bake him into a pudding. I'll get the rolling pin. Get the dough. Poor Tom. They slathered him with butter, covered him in dough, and rolled him flat with the rolling pin. Roly poly, roly poly. What is that sound under the attic floor? Roly poly, roly poly. Roly poly, roly poly, roly poly, roly poly. The cats called the dog. The dog got the saw. And the rats decided it was time to go. The end. Another thing that really influenced me to want to animate with just a couple of elements is uh, the Sesame Street spots where they would introduce the episode with the letter G or the number three. And then they would just have some really quick thrown together little animation that I could tell had only been done in a couple of seconds. I mean, it just, they looked so easy. Also then when MTV came out, they would animate the logo with just like some vibrating colors or it would uh, have some punk music and it was, it was just so bare bones, I absolutely loved it. And I started to develop a great love of black and white when I read Alice in Wonderland for the first time and I saw the illustrations of John Tenniel. There was a play that someone put on of Alice in Wonderland where they took the drawings and they replicated it with real actors and they would draw cross hatching on the sets and on the people to make it look like they were really just stepping out of those drawings. And I loved copying these drawings out of the book. I remember learning how to do cross-hatching from, uh, from this book. I watched this so many times. Um, when I was a kid, we were really at the mercy of what few videos our parents had recorded off of the TV set. Um, so this was one of them that I just watched again and again. <coughs> Um, when I got into high school, a friend introduced me to The Forbidden Zone, which is kind of like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. It's a cult classic, and it's very strange. In this movie, a dapper 50s husband and wife fall into their closet, and they end up in The Forbidden Zone, which is just this crazy black and white world. And it had, I remember, it had little people as chandeliers. It had um, wizards. It had... Uh, nude slaves and it had the whole thing was a musical with uh, the sound was performed by Oingo Boingo so I really started loving this movie but the thing I really loved about it was the sets which were just these cheap black and white thrown together things and this is a mood board which I made for the split house many many years later where I was taking elements from the forbidden zone and using them to design my, my film and here my character is falling into the Forbidden Zone, this is, a, this is a still from the Split House. Here she's crossing one of those dominoes. So I was having a good time. Um, I was just off my mission. I was newly married, but for some reason, I was still depressed. And I remember um, walking through the streets, and this, is, this looks like the traffic on my street. I live on West 34th Street in Manhattan. 
And I remember walking down the street and just thinking that I was like this empty shell and that nobody could see inside and see what was happening inside of me and that we were all these empty shells and um, we were just clogging up the streets. And I made a, an animation about this time period called um, Annie's Circus. Just because I'm losing doesn't mean I'm lost, doesn't mean I'll stop, doesn't mean I'm across. Just because I'm hurting doesn't mean. Doesn't mean I didn't get what I deserve No better and no worse I just got lost Every river that I tried to cross and Every door I ever tried So I was thinking about sadness, of course, but I was also thinking about good and bad. And um, I was thinking about how a lot of times we enjoy being the natural man and making those wrong choices, which we know are wrong, but it's absolutely thrilling to make them at the time. Um, I'm going to show you a clip from a movie I made called Me Good, Me Bad. started around this time and it really I didn't know what it was about it came from a really unresolved place in me and I was just also using that technique of play um, I started filming the split house and I did the first couple of scenes and I just had no idea where the movie was going and I had a feeling that I would have to let time pass and to actually develop more in my life or mentally before I really would know what to do with this movie and so I worked on it over the next 10 years, just picking it up uh, and then putting it down again. And I just felt like there was some kind of an unseen hand that was guiding me along, but not telling me what was going to happen with this movie. Um, I didn't want to just make a movie about sadness, though. I wanted to make something that was poetic. Um, I felt like if I was going to drag people through a low point, I should really give them something that could inspire them as well. So with this movie, um, I just said it. Let's see. Oh, let's watch the movie right now, actually.
to Croatia? Oh, right, you have. Um, the countryside of Croatia where I set this movie is so haunting because it's full of all these uh, abandoned olive groves that don't produce any more olives. And the farmers would take the rocks from the countryside from the farms and they would pile them all up around the olive trees just to make the land more farmable. Um, but it just creates this kind of spooky backdrop. The town that you can see there is the town of Split, where I serve my mission. And this is uh, something I tried out for the first time in this movie, which was using different levels of plexiglass to create shadow and blocking things off up at the top with a cereal box, trying to get all these beautiful grays. And this is what it looks like through the camera, but this is the same thing. So this scene is called In the Village, and it represents the rain that's falling in her mind, even though it's not raining outside. And for most people who struggle with depression, it strikes you even when you're not having a bad day. It's just something that springs up on you. Um, I always draw her or myself wearing a white nightgown in my artwork because I like the way that it's so unspecific to time or place or fashion. There was a book that I loved as a kid called Strega Nona. And if you look at the rooftop, you can see how much it looks like uh, the split house. This is a book that supposedly takes place in Italy. It's about this good witch named Strega Nona, which means uh, witch grandma. And she would heal the townspeople of things like warts and broken hearts. And like the townspeople of Croatia, she would um, make her own homemade pasta. I remember on my mission, Sometimes the uh, grandmas would have a sheet spread out on their rug when I got there that had homemade pasta drying, drying on it that we were going to have in our, in our dinner. And this is what Split looked like. So the title of the movie, The Split House, refers to not only the town of Split, but also the split mind. Um, by this time, I was developing bipolar. so. Uh, the split mind was a really um, apt analogy. Also, it deals with the split family, which is, I know every family goes through this, but um, certain members of my family may not want to be associated with the rest of us. Um, it's just a really a tragedy in my family. So then we come to the scene with the healer. And the cool thing about making this movie over a 10-year period is that the people and places became archetypes where they wouldn't just represent one person or place, they would represent many things. Um, the woman here who's working on me is Surjana, the woman who I dedicated the movie to. She was an investigator, and whenever she had us over to her house, it was just so warm and comforting. And also there was a woman in New York named Karen, who I also am representing here, who would uh, do this thing called body talk, where she would take my hand and she would get biofeedback and be able to get answers from my body telling her what was wrong with it. Um, I use birds a lot in my artwork. Here's a recent drawing that I did. Um, this is a picture of Joseph Smith in Carthage jail, and there's a bird watching over him. And I like to think that birds represent the Holy Ghost. It's something comforting, and it's always there, but we might not realize that it's there. So in my movie, they turn into owls, and by, by turning into owls, they're able to access their inner wisdom, and then she's able to tumble into her own self, uh, subconscious. Here, she has to pass through the eyes, where you have to go that way to get into the brain. So the eyes are the guardians of 
her own forbidden zone. And then she comes to the Yeti monster, which represents not just uh, good and bad, black and white, but it also represents fraternal twins. So in this scene, the Yeti goes like this to beckon you to enter. But also, my twin sister Katie has this tick where her arm will go like this because she got in a car crash, and that was just something she was left with. Not quite sure why. Katie, this is her last year. Um, I like to think of her as black beauty because she's tall, she's dark, she's beautiful. And then next to her, I call myself the little Glivica, which means mushroom, because I'm shorter and more fair. And she also appears later. Uh, you'll remember there was a little black owl in the movie that comes and cuts the octopus tentacles, and that was also Katie. This cat uh, represents danger uh, in the family, and um, it also is a picture of a cat I had as a kid named Blanche who would scratch us. And then we come to this scene with the puddles. Um, this scene is really inspired by a C.S. Lewis book called The Magician's Nephew. And I'm going to read you a little passage from that, from that book. It says, They were standing by the edge of a small pool, not more than 10 feet from side to side in a wood. It was the quietest wood you could possibly imagine. The pool he had just got out of was not the only pool. There were dozens of others, a pool every few yards as far as his eyes could reach. One, two, three, go, said Dickory, and they jumped in. There was no doubt about the magic this time. This scene also reminds me of a multi-level video game. Um, each puddle represents a different issue that you have to tackle to move through your life to a higher and better place. Um, here she looks into the puddle, and it's not clear if she sees her opposite, her evil side, her twin. And I had been thinking a lot about good and bad within ourselves, as well as the good and bad around us. And um, this is a picture of something that frightens me when I'm sleeping uh, alone sometimes. I have this image of, in my mind of uh, the devils from the movie Ghost. I don't know if you guys remember. Those devils are frightening. <laughs> anyway, I felt like if I could start depicting these things in my artwork, that it would be for my benefit. And even though it doesn't make the problem go away, I, I do get something from it. And here I'm confronting those devils in this scene um, with the words of Nephi in the Psalm of Nephi. So she emerges from this dark place and she is overcome by the crashing waves and she hits her head on the bottom of the ocean and she's unconscious. And this part reminds me of a time in my life where I was in spiritual darkness and I was really uh, unsure of what to do because uh, my wrong choices had led me to a place where I was basically paralyzed in my relationships and in my heart and I didn't uh, I didn't have any other recourse other than to get on my knees, and I just told the Lord, nothing that I'm doing is working. I would really appreciate if you could just tell me how to get out of this. What should I do? I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. And that prayer was immediately answered. Um, there was, when I opened my eyes from the prayer, I wasn't going to share this, but when I opened my eyes from the prayer, there was a white card on my bed in front of me, and I said, Whatever's on the other side of this card, that's what I'm going to do. And I flipped it over, and it was a business card from the School of Visual Arts. I had probably gotten that business card three years before, and I don't know how it ended up on the bed, but I went ahead and I applied to the School of Visual Arts without telling my parents, who didn't want me to go. And I went ahead and applied. I got accepted, still didn't tell my parents. And then two weeks later, my dad walked into my bedroom, and he said, I've just been on a business trip to New York City, and I felt prompted that I should go pay a visit to the School of Visual Arts, and I did. I was really impressed. Boy, you should go there. And I just said, well, I've already been accepted. Great. So I went. Um, this is an etching from the exhibit. It's called The Rescue. And when I think about this etching, I think about how our rescue doesn't necessarily come from an expected place. Um, 
it doesn't necessarily come when we expect it will. Um, for example, I wasn't cured of bipolar, but because of three things, I felt like I was rescued. The first thing was my family. One of my biggest fears is that when I'm old, I don't have any children. My husband's quite a bit older than me. I'm always afraid that something will happen to him and who will help me pay for my medication, who will take care of me, you know, all these fears. But my twin sister told me that there's a, there's a special room in her house that she's already given to me so that when I am an old lady, if I'm ever alone, her kids are going to help watch out for me. So the second way that I felt like I was rescued was by the knowledge that I gained in the temple. Um, in the temple, I just realized how bright my future really is um, and how wonderful the next life will be for me. And then the third way that I felt like I was rescued um, was through the Lord. I, I said a prayer, having the faith to be healed. Um, this has probably happened to a lot of you. I had the faith to be healed, but I wasn't healed. And I felt like I got an answer from the Lord that said, Annie, I could solve this for you right now, but I don't want to because I want you to draw close to me and I want you to depend on me. And in that way, we'll have a, a closer relationship. So narwhal horns used to be presented in uh, European courts as unicorn horns. So that's another reason why I feel like the narwhal is a, a magical rescuer. This part uh, called helping hands represents all the anonymous uh, identities of people who have helped me over the years, um, supported me. And I, I didn't show faces because I wanted it to represent everyone. The ship flies the, um, the lion's crest because that's a reference to Aslan from C.S. Lewis, who also represents Christ. And here's another drawing I did recently from the Doctrine and Covenants um, that represents this ship of Christ. In this scene, I'm gently delivered to a priest who puts his hands on my shoulders. This scene is inspired by that wonderful feeling you have before you get a priesthood blessing, when the priest puts his hand on your shoulders and he asks you your full name. That's actually my favorite part of getting a blessing. So the long ordeal is over. She's uh, vanquished the quest. And now she's ready to move on to her final role. These are my two sisters, Sarah and Mary, that are dressing me. And in the end, um, she's going to be strong. She's going to be empathetic towards others because of everything that she's been through. She's going to be a gracious goddess. And she's going to be a mother. This is the ship from the Voyage of the Dawn Treader by C.S. Lewis. And people have asked me, where is she going? Where is the ship going? And in my mind, it's going where the Dawn Treader was going. And it says, this is from C.S. Lewis' book. It says, but now they could look at the rising sun and see it clearly and see things beyond it. What they saw eastward beyond the sun was a range of mountains. It was so high that either they never saw the top of it or they forgot it. And the mountains must really have been outside the world. For any mountains, even a 20th of that height, ought to have had ice and snow on them. But these were warm and green and full of forests and waterfalls, however high you looked. No one in the boat doubted that they were seeing beyond the world into Aslan's country. If there was a takeaway message that I hope people got from this movie, it would be to treat each other gently, because behind every smiling face, there's a struggle. Um, also, it would be that even if your feet seem to be stuck in the mud, your hands are free to reach up into the heavens and grasp the hands of the Lord. And at the end of this piece, I, I wrote a little Croatian folk song. Um, I'm going to see if I can find my translation of it. Well, I can tell you. Um, it basically says, sleep, sleep, our dear ones sleep. He will guard you, give you strength. This boat is your source of strength. God's love is your key. And um, that's the end. Thank you.